Hello there and welcome back. In the previous episode we created this terrain and I had some time so I made these mountains look a little bit more realistic with uh, these spikes here. So I used uh, all the different brushes we have to give them this special uh, look. And I hope you also played a bit with your terrain. In this episode we're going to do two things. So the first thing we're going to do is actually be able to interact with objects. For now we only have these trees as objects, but later on we're going to have more and more objects and we want to interact with them, right? So usually in first person games there is some kind of little dot in the middle of the screen that helps us uh, keep track where is the middle, right? Because right now, if we play, we don't have anything to indicate what is the middle. So if, for example, we want to point on this tree or select this tree, it's not that easy because we don't know where this middle is. And it's more important when we actually want to point on, on something like uh, some kind of enemy or we want to anything that requires us to actually interact with something using our camera, right? So we're going to create this option and we're going to be able to interact with these objects. So right now we're only going to be able to get their name, but later on we're going to be able to actually do things and uh, with these trees, for example, we're going to be able to chop them down and with other things we're going to be able to pick up. So this is just the beginning, but we're going to do that in this episode. The next thing we're going to do is actually create some very basic AI. So we're going to have some creatures that will move around in our scene, just wander around to give some uh, life into the game. Right now we're going to just make them walk around, we're not going to fight them or something, but we just want to create this uh, basic AI and we're going to be able to actually interact with them the same way like we interact with the trees. We're going to be able to point at them and see their name for now. So first of all, let's create this little pointer on the screen. To do that, we simply click here on the screen and we create UI and canvas. And inside the canvas, we are going to create UI image. And if we go, I created a few folders here. So I have my scripts folder, I have my prefabs, and I have art. All the rest are the packages that I downloaded. And I also have scenes. So if I go into the art, I also created another folder for the UI art have this sphere that I created. So that's a very simple image you can do in any photo editor. It's just a small white circle. So I'm going to use this sphere to create this small little dot. So all I need to do is click on this image and drag this sphere inside the source image. Of course, don't forget that when you bring this image inside, you need to first import it so you need to make sure that it's a sprite and then you need to apply some kind of compression on it and then you can actually use it. So now that we have it here inside the source image, we can zoom back and see that it actually appears on the UI, but we don't want it to be that big. So we're going to make it smaller. We're going to change the scale here to something like 0 0.05. Okay, so now it's a very small dot and if we play, you can actually see this little dot over here, okay? So you can do something else. You can maybe put a small little reticle or a different color or whatever you want, but that's the way I'm going to do that. And of course, when we place it on our canvas, make sure that the positioning is 0, 0, 0 because we want it to be 
in the exact center also anchor it to the center okay so then when we actually point on something it will be in the center of the screen okay so now we have this thing but we can't do anything with it right now so let's move on uh, before we actually go into the script we're going to click on the canvas and create another thing we're going to create a UI text and we're going to call it interaction info UI you can call it whatever you want that's the way I'm calling it so we're going to use this text to actually display the name of the item that we hover over with our mouse right with our little pointer so it's very common in survival games and when you walk around and you see a stone then you just hover over the stone and it tells you that it's a stone and whatever you need to do so right now it's in the middle we're going to align it to the center and we're going to move it a little bit below this little dot you can place it wherever you want on the screen I'm just going to place it here for now we're going to change the style to bold and the color to white and maybe the size a little bit to 18 okay later on we can also change the font but we need to import fonts so we're going to do that later and now if we play you can see that we have this little text on the screen but of course we don't need to see this text all of the time we only need to see it when we actually hover over something so we're going to just disable it so we don't see it okay and then when we actually hover over something we can enable it but in the beginning it will be disabled okay so in order to deal with all of this selection and interaction of items we are going to create a system a manager to do that so i already have the script and i'm going to provide it again in the paste bin i don't know if i'm going to do that all of the time some of the time i'm just going to show you and you're going to copy it but for now i'm going to share it with you in the link in the description so first of all i go here into the script folder and we have it here the selection manager okay so the selection manager is the script that we're going to use to deal with all of the selection but in order to use it we are going to create an empty object and we're going to call it selection manager as well and we're simply going to drag this script on this empty object okay so again like I showed you in the previous episode you go to paste bin you copy everything from within the class and you just paste it inside and make sure that the class name and the class file have the same name okay and the script file have the same name with the exact capital and lowercase letters so now that we created this empty object and we dragged our selection manager script on it we can see that we need a reference to an object which is interaction info ui and it's exactly this one so we're going to do that now we're going to drag it inside because we need a reference to it in order to enable it and disable it when we hover over something or not right so we're going to do that from within the selection manager and now let's go into the selection manager let's open up the script let's just close all of these so in the selection manager we have this game object the interaction info ui so it's public because we want to actually reference it in the inspector and then we also have here a reference to the interaction text so that's a reference for the actual component of the text because if we go here 
can see that this entire thing is a game object, but we want to reference this text component. So in the start, we take the interaction info UI and we get the component text and we place it inside the interaction text. Okay, so now we have the game object itself and we have the text component. So we can change the text whenever we want. Then in the update method, we're simply creating array, okay, because we want to cast array from the middle of the screen. So that's exactly what we're doing here camera.main.screen.array and input point mouse position because we want to get the position of the mouse which is locked in the middle because you remember we locked it in the middle of the screen in the previous uh, when we created the mouse movement script right here cursor lock state and we locked it in the middle of the screen so now it will send array from the middle of the screen and it will search if it actually hits something so in order to check if it hits something, we're going to use this physics.raycast. And here it says that we need to provide array and we also need to provide array cast hit. Okay, so we create a ray cast hit here, we call it hit. And then we check if physics.raycast and we provide the ray that we created. And then we also provide the ray cast hit. So we want to put the information inside this hit so whatever this ray is pointing at it will put it inside this hit and then we simply insert this information the information that is inside this hit we place it in this variable so the hit dot transform we place it inside here so now we have a selection transform and this selection transform is the actual transform of the object that we hit okay so if we go here and we hit this tree for example then the selection transform will simply become the transform of this tree okay and the same thing with everything else but now we have something that we need to check because if we point on the ground it will get the transform of the ground if we hit the mountain or the sky or something else it will also get the transform of these things but we are not interested in that we're only interested in specific items items or objects that we want to interact with them right so we don't care we don't care if we actually hit this ground because there's nothing to do with this ground we do want to get the information of this tree we do want to get information of maybe stones or sticks or things that we can pick up. So that's why we need a way to check if the thing that we hit is actually something that we want to interact with. So a way we can do it is we're going to create another component, right? Another script for interactable objects. And we're going to place that on every prefab that we want to interact with okay so then we're simply checking if this game object that we hit we're searching for a component and if we actually find an interactable object component okay so this is a class we created so we can see it here so i also provide it in the link below we have the script of an interactable object so this interactable object simply has a public string item name and a method that returns an item name which is a string right so it returns a string and it gets the item name of this object so later on we're going to expand that and we're going to put other things inside but for now we're simply using this script to get the item name of this object and to also know that this object is interactable right because if it actually has this script then it will be true right because if selection transform get component 
and it actually finds this component, then we can do something. Else, so if we don't find this component on the object, then we're not going to do something, right? So now that we have this interactable object script, we're going to place it on all of our trees, but we don't have to do it one by one. We can simply go to the prefabs. So in the prefabs, I have the prefab of our tree and I'm simply going to select it and drag the interactable object on this tree. Okay. So now it has this script and I'm going to give it a name. Let's just call it tree. Okay. So now that's the name of the object. Okay. And now because that's a part of the prefab, all of these will also have this script on them. Okay. So we don't have to actually put it on every one of them because all of these are just copies of this prefab. So now all of these have this interactable object. So now what will happen when we actually point on one of these trees, it will find this component on them. So it will know that it's actually an interactable object. So it will do this. And what is this? It will take the interaction text, the one here that we, the component that we referenced here, and we're going to change its text to selection transform dot get component interactable object dot get item name. So we're going inside this class and we're just calling this method. We're getting the item name and the item name, we set it here in the inspector, right? We set it here. So each prefab will have its own name. So it will get this name. It will return the item name and it will send it and place it here inside the text of the interaction text. And then it will take this entire UI, the interaction info UI, and it will just set it active. So because it will become active, we're going to be able to see it on the screen with the new text. Okay. But if the selection will suddenly go to, let's say the ground, then we're going to turn off this UI. Okay. So we won't be able to see it anymore. Okay. So let's see how it actually works. So we have these trees, we have this script on them. So let's play. And now if we go here and we point on this tree, we actually see tree. And then we point here, it disappears. Point back tree. And we can do that with every tree. Good. So now we can actually get the item name of all of our items, right? There's nothing much to do with the, the name of these items. It's good to know what there are. Sometimes we want to walk around and just get names of different objects. But later on, we're going to be able to use this script to actually interact and do things and pick up items and check uh, all kinds of options we can perform. For example, I wrote down three, but we can also do something like that. We can type in need needs axe, something like that, or use axe. Okay. So now when we go to a tree, well, it actually didn't save it because I only selected one. Again, we need to go to the prefab birch tree and here we want to change it. Axe needed something like that. So when we approach a tree, then it says ax needed. So we know that there's actually something to do with a tree. We need an ax or we need something to chop it down. And then when we're going to have an ax, we can simply approach this tree and then it will say, click on the left mouse button to chop down or just press on something to interact. And then we're going to start to chop the tree down. So this thing is useful in different ways. Okay. 
and here we're going to change it back let's just remove this and let's also remove it from the prefab okay so now we can see that we have the selection manager we linked it with the interaction in for ui so it becomes active each time we hover over something and it gets disabled when we hover on the ground okay so that's good and now we covered this part of selecting things and interacting with things right of course later on we're going to be able to pick up objects and we're going to be able to use objects and interact with objects but we just needed this very basic script to start with something the next thing we want to do as i told you is to add some life into our environment right it's not that important but it's just something i wanted to show you how to do right now and later on we're going to be able to actually interact with these creatures and also do all kinds of actions maybe hunt maybe gather so it's good that we have them right now so in order to actually make it look uh, like something and not just use primitive uh, objects you can use whatever you want you can use any kind of creature or animal that fits into your environment i'm going to use this free asset from the asset store the white rabbit okay so you simply download it and import it into your game it's for free and again i'm going to leave this link in the description here i downloaded this rabbit package and we have different animations and we have the model itself so all i did was create a prefab i took the this prefab of the rabbit i dragged it inside my scene and then i dragged it inside my prefabs folder so it became a prefab and now i only need to change the prefab and it will change all the other clones that i have in the scene okay so i have this prefab here and i created two versions okay i created a small one and a bigger one so i simply changed the scale of the big one okay and we can see that we have an animator on it so when we download this package we already have an animator but we need to attach the controller on it so if it's not attached you simply go here into the rabbits and you go into animations no into demo animator and you drag this demo animator onto your prefab okay You drag it over here to this slot then the second thing we need to add is this box collider i don't know why i have two of them i only need one of them okay because we don't want uh, the rabbit to fall through the terrain so we want a box collider okay and we also want a rigid body because we want to use gravity we don't want him to just stay in one position on the in the air or something because if he moves from a certain elevation, we don't want him to just keep on walking. We want him to actually fall down. Okay. So that's why we use this rigid body. And besides this rigid body and besides this box collider, I have this AI movement script. Okay. But before I show you the script, I just want to talk about the animator. So you click on the rabbit let's just delete this one I'm going to use my prefab so I have a small rabbit here and you can do that with every creature so when you click on your prefab you can go to the animation panel the animator panel and you can see that we also have a death animation we have a run animation we have an idle animation and we have a death animation right now we're not going to deal with the death animation I simply put the entry animation as the idle one so if it's not attached simply go here and then search for the idle one okay 
And then there's the run one. So again, you can go here and find the run animation. And I simply created these transitions from idle to run. So it uses this parameter is running. Okay, so I created a new bool and I called it is running. So when is running is true, it starts running. And when is running is false, it becomes idle. So that's a very simple animation. Okay, so it's a very good package because these animations come with this rabbit. Okay, so there's the idle animation, and there's the run animation. And I simply use this bool to control them. If it's true, it runs. If it's false, it becomes idle again. So I just want to show you how to set it up if it doesn't work for you. So now that we have our little rabbit and we have the animator, let's talk about this AI movement. So again, you're going to find that in the description box. Let's go to our scripts and let's open the AI movement. So this AI movement, it's, let's just make it bigger. I think it's better for you to see it like this. So this AI movement script is a very general script. So it's not meant for this bunny, right? There's nothing here inside that tells us that it's just for this bunny. We can use this AI script for every creature that just wanders around, okay? Of course, later on, we're going to add more things and more functionalities, but still, it's not something meant for just one kind of creature. We can use that and place it on every creature that we have. Simply drag it over here, and then we control the different speed, and these things, we can always change them, okay? So now that we have our AI movement, let's see what's going on inside. We have an animator, okay? So it's simply a reference to the animator we have on our rabbit. So in the start, we just get a reference to the component, the animator, okay? Then we have a public float move speed, so we can change it from the inspector. Although I placed it on 0.2, as default, but we can always change that. Then we have a vector tree, which is the stop position. So we use that in order to stop our bunny because we want our bunny, our rabbit, to walk around for some time and then stop for some time and then walk again. So we need to determine what is the position that he stops in. So that's why we need this vector tree. Then we have a float that is the walk time. Then we have a public float, which is the walk counter. We have the wait time. We have the wait counter. Then we have another int that is the walk direction. Then we have a public bool that is, is walking. We check if the AI is actually walking or not. And then we have this start method. So again, as I told you, we have this reference to the animator. Then we have these two variables, the walk time and the wait time. So the walk time is basically the time the AI will walk, okay? And then wait time is the time that the AI will just wait. So if we're going to set the same values for all of our clones, right, all of these creatures, then what we're going to see is that they all walk at the same time, and they all stop at the same time and then they begin to walk together. So it will be very weird and unnatural. That's why inside this script, I created this option to make it random, okay? So at the start, each clone, right? Each bunny, each rabbit will get a different walk time and a different wait time. So it will be random between every one of them. You don't need to do that. You need, don't need to go and say, okay, this rabbit, I want him to wait a certain amount and I want him to walk. And you don't need to do that because if you're going to have a hundred different rabbits, 
you don't need to do that one by one. Because we have these two lines of code here, it will do that. It will just create a random number between 3 and 6. And, and here it will do it between 5 and 7. Again, these have no meaning. It's just numbers that I gave. So I think that the walk time should be somewhere around 3 seconds and 6 seconds. And the wait time should be between 5 and 7. So again, it really doesn't mean anything. You can use whatever numbers you want. If you want them to walk for a long time, then you can just set higher numbers. If you want them to wait for a different time, you can just set different numbers. But it will just give different values to different clones of these prefabs. So each prefab, so each bunny will just have different times, okay? And then we simply set the wait counter and the walk counter to the wait time and walk time that we get here because we want to reset the counter, okay? So we use these counters to actually check the time that have passed. So we check how much time did he actually walk and we check how much time did he actually wait, okay? So at the beginning, we actually set it to be equals to the initial time, okay? And then at the beginning, after we do all of this, we actually go to this method, choose direction. So it goes here and it chooses a direction to go to. So here again, we use this random range. So it will give one of these numbers. It will give either zero or one or two or three. It won't give four, right? Because here it says return a random integer number between minimum and maximum exclusive. So it won't choose four. It will choose zero or one or two or three. Okay. So we have four options because there are four directions the bunny can move. Okay. I just wanted to make very simple. I want him to go either forward, either this way, either this way, or either this way. Okay. Again, he will walk in a certain direction. He will stop and wait for a certain time, and then he will choose another direction. And then he will go to that direction and then he will stop and wait and choose another direction and go to another direction. So he will always be in motion and he won't just go to one direction, right? So it will be random. So that's why we use this random. It will just choose a direction each time he starts walking. So now when it chooses a direction, we're setting is walking to true and we're resetting the walk counter again because here we just reset it at the start but then we need to reset it also each time we start walking and because is walking is true right now in the update method it's true so it will actually run this code okay so if is walking is true so if it actually chose the direction so it's ready to move because it chose the direction. So is walking become true? And then it will run this code. So we're setting this is running bool to be true. So we're using the animator component to set this bool to is running, right? If we go to the animator, we can see that we need to use this is running. We need to set it to true because when it's true, it means that it says run, but I actually mean just walk, right? So if it's true, then the bunny will run. And if it's false, he will become idle. So if you use it on other creatures, just make sure you're using this name, right? Is running. Even if it's not running, even if it's just walking or, I don't know, crawling or something use is running or just change it here in the script. Otherwise it won't work. You need this to be the same name. So even if we're going to have different creatures, we can still use the same name for their running. Okay. So we don't have to change the script to fit it to different creatures. We can still use the same script for many creatures. So we're setting the animation to running. So we will start running. 
and then we're simply decreasing the walk counter by time delta time. So what happens here is because it happens in the update and the update is basically called every frame. So it actually will reduce one second every time. Okay. So it will take the time delta time and it will reduce one second at a time. So if the walk counter, for example, here was set to five seconds, then here it will go and be five, four, three, two, one. And when this walk counter goes down, it will run this code. It will actually move the rabbit. And then here, it checks if the walk counter actually reached zero. So it will go down, it will be five, four, three, two, one, and then it reached zero. So it will stop the movement. Okay. But we're going to reach that. So while it's still counting, right? While the walk counter still goes down, it will do this. It will actually move the AI. So here, when we chose a walk direction, right? We chose an integer and we placed it inside walk direction. We're simply creating a switch to check what will happen in case one of these numbers are selected, right? Because we have four options. As I said, we want him to either go over here, over here, over here, or over here. So we have four options. So we use this switch statement and we are checking what is the value of walk direction. So if it's zero, it will do something. If it's one, if it's two, or if it's three. So all it does here in the beginning, it just changes the rotation, right? Because we want him to move forward. We don't want him to move this way like he's walking backwards and we don't want him to move this way on the side. We want him to face the direction he's walking. Okay. We want him to walk with his head forward. So that's why we need to first rotate him to the direction he wants to go. So these lines are all the same when we actually move him to the direction, but these lines are different because here in case zero, we're taking the transform, the local rotation, and we're not rotating it because you can see zero, zero, zero. It means that we're not doing any rotation. And in this case, he will actually just move forward because he is not rotating. He will just keep moving forward again. But here in this case, in case two, we're going to change the Y rotation by 90 degrees. So what will happen? It will simply change the Y rotation by 90 degrees. And you can watch here. We are going to rotate him by 90 degrees. So he will rotate exactly to this position, right? And then he will walk forward and the same happens with the other cases, minus 90 or 180. So he will either go this way. He will either move to 180, right? Which is the opposite direction, or he will move to minus 90. Well, it really is relative on where he starts, but if he goes this way, then it's minus 90. Okay. So it will choose one of these directions and it will just phase the direction, right? So the difference is the rotation on the Y axis, right? We're rotating on the Y axis. We can see it here. So let's just move him the way he was. Okay. So that's the beginning. And then when it actually changes the rotation, so either it's not rotating or it's rotating by 90 degrees. So to that direction or to the left or backwards <clears throat> after it changed the rotation, it will simply take the position of the transform, which is our rabbit. 
and it will add movement on the forward axis times move speed times delta time. So the move speed, it's something we set here and it's something we can change in the inspector, but it will simply multiply the forward movement. And we remember it from the previous scripts that forward is simply the blue axis, right? So the blue axis is this front axis, right? So it will move him forward on the blue axis. And if he rotated here, he will still move on the blue axis. And if it rotated here, he will still move on the blue axis. So we're always moving him on the blue axis. That, that's why we always use this transform forward. And then we simply multiply it by speed and by time delta time so that it will be consistent with the different frames. Okay, so we do all of this and then he will simply move forward. Okay, he will not move a certain distance. He will just keep moving forward but eventually he will stop because this timer, the walk counter, will eventually reach zero and then it will stop him. So then we're taking the stop position, we're taking the current position of the rabbit and we're placing it inside the stop position vector. So we need to check where he is at now. Then we're also setting the is walking to false and we're just saying that transform position will become the stop position. So now you're not moving anymore anywhere. You're just going to stay at this position that you were when the timer hit zero. Because here it hit zero and he was at this point in space. So he will become stationary on this point. Right? So if the timer went and he walked, walked, walk, and then the timer reached zero when he was here, so it will save this position, it will save the coordinates and place them inside stop position, and then it will just change the transform to stop position, so he will no longer keep walking. He will just stay here and wait. And he will wait here, and we are also changing the animator back to false so he will stop moving so the animation will be the idle animation right and then we're also resetting the weight counter and then because is walking is false it will no longer run this code because it's false it will run this code and here it will simply do the same thing, but now with the wait counter. So now we're going to wait a certain amount of seconds and he will just stand idle until this timer runs out. So when this counter will reach zero, then he will again choose a, a direction. And when he chose a direction, he will walk again and because he is walking, he will run this code again and it will do it all over again. Okay, so that's the script. Uh, it took me a few hours to actually write everything down. I tried many things. I also tried to do it with the nav agent, right? With the navigation so he will be able to walk and avoid obstacles. But we don't really need him to follow us or chase us we just need him to walk around and i thought it would be just much simpler to do it with this regular transform and not use the nav agent this time later on we're going to use the nav agent for different things but for now we're going to do that with this very simple way okay so that's this script and then we are simply placing this script on our creature. Again, this is the default value. You can change it. I just feel like it's very fast if it stands on something higher, but you can play with that. And here we're simply going to see the walk counter and the weight counter. 
so I made them public just so we can see how much time is left. And we can also see if it's working or not. So now if we play, we can actually see our little bunny running around. So you can see he waits. Let me show you this in the... Just play. We can see that over here, right? So you can see we have the walk counter and the wait counter. So he waits and then when the counter reaches zero, he walks and then again he waits for a few seconds. And then when it reaches zero, he walks for a few seconds and then he waits for a few seconds. So it always goes between these two. And if we add more rabbits all we need to do is go to our prefabs and add more rabbits so we can put well, let's go here we can just add more small rabbits we can also put a big one like the king or the mother and we play and now each one of them will get a different value so they will not run and wait at the same time sometimes they will go at the same direction but that's just in the beginning. Afterwards, they will all just be randomized. So you can see some of them wait, some of them run. And it's actually cool because now we have, oh, I stepped on one. And now they just walk around. So later on, we can do nice things with them. We can maybe pet them or pick them up or even hunt them and take their meat. I don't know. It depends on you, of course. So you can see a very cute little rabbit and his rabbit babies. And they can walk around inside the grass. So it looks very, very cool. And now we can also do the same thing we did with the trees. We're simply going into our scripts and we're going to take this interactable script and we're going to place it on our prefab. So we have our white rabbit. Let's put this interactable on him. So I'm simply dragging the interactable object script on our white rabbit. Let's call it white rabbit. And let's do the same thing with the big white rabbit. Big white rabbit. So I'm simply dragging and dropping this script on every item that I want to interact with. For now, we don't have any interaction. We can just get their name. But later on, we're going to be able to interact with them. So now if we play, we can actually point on them. It will say big white rabbit or simply white rabbit. Oh, what happened to this one? Yeah, there's some strange thing here with the rotation. I'm going to figure that out. You can see when they wait, they actually rotate a bit. But I think it has something to do with the animation and yeah also if the rabbit pushes him so there's a lot of little things we need to change of course later on and again the point here is not to get some kind of polished game but to just understand the way we can do all of this little by little we're going to polish as much as we can we're going to make them look better and the point that they're actually going to run in the grass so we're not going to really see any weird little things and for example we're going to go to a different place so there will be other creatures and other animals and we come back here we are still going to see these rabbits because eventually even though the movement is randomized they will always just walk in this area, right? Not because I put any boundary, but because they will always change the direction 
and just walk here. I will be very surprised if one of them will reach far away. Maybe it will happen, like if I play for an hour or two, right? But for now, they all stay here. Of course, if they reach the end of the world, they will fall down. But it's cool. So, this episode was a little bit longer because I want to show you these two things. In the next episode, we're going to finally pick up items. So, we're going to have maybe a rock or a stick. And we're going to see how we can actually pick these items. And of course, for that, we also need to create an inventory. So, we're going to create a UI for an inventory and pick up these items. So we're going to approach them and just click and pick them up and they will appear in our inventory. But that's all for this episode. So you can do that with other creatures. You can play around with these scripts and do whatever you want. So thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you're still not subscribed. Uh, you are going to see all the newest episodes this way. It will just appear. You can also click on the little bell and then it will actually notify you whenever there's a new episode. And of course, it will also support me. So, see you next time.